if you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalm 139. Ooh, this is a good one. Psalm 139. Verses 23 through 24. Simply says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now turn to me to the book of James. Ooh. <laughs> Don't you guys, I don't, I, I, so you know how you make friends with your Bible, amen? amen? You make friends with your Bible. You know, and, and it's like you get to know the writers of the book. Like John, like whenever I need some encouragement and I'm feeling down, where do I go? I go to First John. I go to John the Beloved. Yes. Amen? Yes. He's sweet. He's tender. You know what I'm saying? It's like, Beloved, I write these things to you that you do not sin. But if you do, don't worry. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, you know? Confess your sins to the Lord for he is faithful and just to cleanse you all your sin on rights. Like, John the Love is so sweet and like he walks you through it. Peter, you know, he's, he's edgy, but at the same time, you sense that like he's been through some stuff. So I like reading Peter too. But then you got James. <laughs> and James is that like really close friend of yours that doesn't have a filter <laughs> and just speaks truth and love. So they like, you know, they really love you, but they're like correcting you the entire time. So yeah, turn to me to James chapter number one. <laughs> I love how it just starts too. James one verse two, my brethren, here, let, let me just start. I'll start right, right, right at the beginning. Okay. Even how he starts. You know, he kind of starts the James Bond serve of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Okay. My brethren, you're like, oh, this is going to be good. Count it all joy. Yes. When you fall into various trials, <laughs> knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Everybody say patience. But let's patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Tonight I'm going to share a word with you simply called, there's purpose in the pressing. There's purpose in the pressing. This last year I um, was uh, uh, in the summertime. Are y'all like me to where when you find like a really good worship song, that's all you listen to? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Like I put it on repeat. Like So this past week, we had an awesome week of uh, 6 a.m. prayer right here. Shout out to everyone. Wasn't that awesome? Did y'all enjoy that? I love doing that with you guys. So awesome. Well, Brooke Franks put together a playlist for us, which is fire. And there's a song on there that I never heard by Corey Russell's daughter. It's called I Want to Burn. That's my new worship song. I almost sent it to Emma tonight and was like, can we please? You know, I send in special requests all the time. All right. Um, so that's my new worship song. So uh, over the summer, I was doing a uh, youth camp, and every now and then, I love when this happens, when it will be an altar ministry, and God will start ministering to me, even though I'm the minister. You know what I'm saying? You're like, all of a sudden, this song comes on. I'm like, this is really powerful. And it was a song that simply said, uh, it, and I, I'll read it to you in a minute. I, I ended up going and finding it. It's from a worship leader out of IHOP called uh, Olivia Buckles. Is it Buckles or Buckley? <laughs> I don't know. Buckley, I think. Olivia something. And um, so the song is very simple, but she starts singing. She says, press me like the olive until the oil pours forth. I am yours to use God. And she says some other things, but that's pretty much what she says over and over. Press me like the olive. I would sing it for you, but I'm not going to do that. I'll ruin the song for you. You just need to go Google it. It's called Weak and Broken Vows. It's very powerful. I sent it to Emma and Delana over the summer. I was like, we need to do this at every altar call. And it's just, press me like the olive until the oil pours forth. So not to go super in detail, long story short, that summer I end up having an incredible summer with the Lord, seeing God do incredible things. I'm traveling and ministering. It was awesome. Uh, but in the midst of that, I found myself, I stepped into this very challenging testing season. So I've never battled with anything like that before. A lot of just heavy mind stuff, heaviness, just really struggling, not knowing what was going on. Praise God for the Barnetts and for the Sozo team, David Adam, because I hit him up and I was like, we need to talk. <laughs> 
Amen. So I went in and, and had an encounter with the Lord, brought so much clarity. And I remember even on the other side of that, kind of walking through this heaviness, walking through some of the stuff I was battling with. And I asked the Lord one day, I was like, Lord, what's going on? Do you ever have those moments where you're like, you mind letting me in on something here? You know, it's like, can you just give me a little like, just a, just, just a morsel. You know what I'm saying? Like, help her. I don't need to know all of it. Just let me know what's going on because what I'm facing right now, what I'm going through right now is challenging. It's hard. I just need to know what is happening. And all of a sudden, um, I think I literally, I remember I was in my kitchen. I was like making breakfast. I was like, Lord, what's going on? I don't understand this. And I was, all of a sudden, I just heard the Holy Spirit say, press me like the olive till the oil pours forth. I am yours to use, God. And I thought, Lord, you didn't really take me seriously when I said that, did you? <laughs> I just love the song. I didn't. And I thought, oh, I'm like anointing, Lord. Like, that's what I want. Like, President, like, I want the oil. I want to be oily, you know. But I, instead, I got a trial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't realize that little prayers like that, like, God, use me. He takes notice. And he says, okay. Because on the other side of every single one of those prayers, in order for this, us to get where we're at to where God wants us to be, there's a thing called process. We, we pray, at the, you know, I, 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 even the moment we just shared with the Durkins, it's like I, I was having coffee with them the other day, and it's that whole thing where it's like we sing the song, send me, send me, send me until he taps on your shoulder. And we're like, I was saying hypothetically. <laughs> you know. Like, it's so easy. Like, I, I remember just sitting there and thinking, wow, like, okay, I've been in. Then I was like, I ain't never listened to that song again. <laughs> That's it. And I realized that as I begin to pray that prayer, God press me. God, I want you to use me. What I was really praying, God began to do because there was some stuff on the inside of me that in order for me to move forward in Him, He had to take care of. That there's some stuff on the inside of us that... Yes, we want to be used by God. Yes, we want to see these things. Yes, yes, we want to be a part of God's story. And God's wanting to do that in us. But He's wanting us to understand this. He's wanting to fashion us into His image. He's wanting to make us into His image. And, you know, here we have James writing to us and saying, we got to count it joy. When we fall into various trials, we, we, we need to take a step back and rejoice. When you're going through that hard situation and you're struggling and you're laying in your bed at night with tears streaming down your face and you are being challenged and things are being pulled out of you and you're homesick and all these different things are going on, we have to realize at the end of the day, his hand is in the middle of the trial. His hand, he's in the middle of that situation that's fashioning us into his image. So I want to help you tonight. I want to encourage you and I want to bring some fresh hope. If you're in that place where you're like, man, I'm, I'm being tested. <laughs> I would ask you to raise your hand, but I ain't going to do that. You know, you're being, you're being tested. You're, you're in that season where you're being stretched, where things aren't looking the way you thought they would look or the timeline that you had that things were going to change. It hasn't changed yet. Listen, I want to give you a few things just to help you through this next uh, season of your life, and then we're going to pray, okay? We have to understand that God takes us through these processing seasons to develop within us the call to bear the image of Christ. And that brings me to, the, to our first point, okay? In a world of false comforts, it is easy 
to deceive ourselves into thinking we're something that we're actually not. Get that? In a world of false comforts, it's very easy to cover and to make up for that what is lacking in us spiritually. We, we live in a society, we live in a world that um, champions burnout, that champions busyness. That's why we run from silence and solitude so much. Because when we get in silence and solitude, we have the revelation of our lack of spirituality. And it's like as soon as we stop scrolling and as soon as we, our favorite Netflix series over, as soon as we stop and slow down, all of a sudden we are able to look in and realize I am missing some stuff in our lives. Because here's the deal. I don't know about you, but I'm not content with just being a good person. I want to bear his image. I think sometimes we can settle there. I'm good. I don't drink, smoke, cuss. I'm, I'm just a good person. I'm nice to people most of the time. I'm just a good person. But, but we're not called just to settle on a place of good. He wants us to step in and to bear that image. It's so easy for us to have these false comforts that trick us into believing. Can I tell you, a lot of people have a false peace. It's not real peace. Why? Because when something happens, it's shaken. The peace that comes from our God, our world cannot take away. And if we're not careful, we can so stuff ourselves with these fake things that when we do enter into a trial, we're shaken because we filled ourselves to believe the lie that we have peace and reactionality. We just have entertainment. Get that. We tricked ourselves into believing we have peace when we're just zoned out watching television. And, and when those things, that's why I love, listen, I was about to say that's why I love fasting, but <laughs> search me and know me, God. <laughs> See if there be. <laughs> I ain't never met nobody who's been like, I just love to fast. I love when Lou Engle ministers when he's open about it. He's like, I break so many fasts. I'm like, thank you, Lou. <laughs> thank you. Doesn't it encourage you to hear when Lou Engle breaks a fast? Fasting goes either one to two ways. Fasting is either going to be glorious or it's going to be terrible. You know? Either fasting, you're going to have this like download of revelation. You're encountering God and having dreams. It's just like you're so fired up. Or from the first meal you miss, God is like stepped out of the chat. And you're drawing close to God to hear from him. And you're like, hold up. I was hearing you just fine when I had dominoes at the house, but now that I threw all my food out, where are you, Lord? It's that fasting brings that thing in us that's like, oh, man, maybe I'm not doing so good. You know, I remember a few years ago, it was a long time ago, I think 2018, this was right before I, you know, I really began to like try to be healthy and all that stuff, try to eat healthy and eat right. Lexi came home, and I'm pretty sure it was a strategy of the enemy. She came home with this book <laughs> called Whole 30. I think Lauren Bentley gave it to her. So. <laughs> Sam knows where I'm coming from with this. She said, We're, hey, let's do this Whole 30. So I'm like, what is it? And Matt knows where I'm talking about too. <laughs> Because this, this is not part of this story. I actually, a few months ago, I was like, Matt, let's do Whole30 together. And so we started, and I quit four days in. <laughs> and he was like, how's it going? I was like, dude, I'm not going to lie, I quit. <laughs> so years ago, we started in this Whole30, and pretty much what it is is zero processed foods. Exactly. Zero processed foods. So like, your chicken's bland and dry. You know, like, no sugar. Not, you can't even do barbecue sauce. They say you can make, like, a Whole30 approved barbecue sauce, but it's, like, not barbecue sauce. You can't do none of that stuff, guys. None of it. 
Well, I went, and that, it's funny how they lay it out because they actually tell you exactly what you experience as you go through it. Like one, to, the first like three or four days, you're just like stupid hungry all the time. Even though you eat like tons of food, you're just starving. Well, then it says the sixth day is like the anger day. <laughs> and you know, y'all, y'all, we've done like, y'all know me, okay? Like, I'm a pretty happy guy. Like, I, I, I'm a pretty happy, I love, you know, I'm just, there's not much that can bother me or affect, like, I'm just a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, okay? Y'all, <laughs> I turned into a different person. Ask Lexi. I'll never forget, we're like driving down the road, going on a trip, and I was just angry. <laughs> and guys, it scared me because I was like, Am I really saved? Do I have the joy of the Lord or just process food? It's like, I don't have the joy apparently because I haven't had Pringles in a few days. So I'm going to kill somebody. I was like, not to the point where I was like, Lexi, I have to break this. If not, I'm going to sin. I think I'm living in sin. So I had to like eat Taco Bell. Then I repented before the Lord. And the joy came back. Anyway, it was like the peace came back. I was like, Lord, there you are. Man. Whole 30 is not for the faint of heart, man. But isn't it interesting how we have those things that make us feel like we're good or the crutches that we've developed that that on the outside we're good and we're great until all of a sudden the Lord pulls those crutches away and we realize our weaknesses. We are very good at running from our weaknesses. We're very good at covering up our weaknesses. We don't want to acknowledge them. We don't, we don't want to. Uh, even, even in the place of prayer, we come to God sometimes and we kind of push those things to the side when in reality, all things are laid bare before Him. So why don't we confess it before Him? It's easy to deceive ourselves into believing it's something that we're not. But listen, when we're in these seasons of testing, that's where God pulls that out of us. We're not able to practice faith until we're in a situation that needs desperate faith. We're not able to practice humility until, as the Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He wants to create that within us. He's wanting to point that thing out on the inside of us. It says, I want to bring you somewhere, but before you do, I've got to shine light into those places that you thought that you had covered up. Listen, the second thing is this that we have to see. In the call to be Christ-like, we magnify the gifts when he magnifies the fruit. Get that. And I've done this for years. I love reading the Gospels. I love reading, um, just, I, I love just pondering on Jesus and thinking about the Lord and reading his interactions. I love the Gospels, okay? And I love reading about the miracles. I love the opening of blind eyes and the raising of Jairus' daughter and, and all of these miracles, the multiplication of, uh, of the food. I love these, but we've got to make sure that we understand Jesus is showing us a holistic way to live on the earth. As sons and daughters who've been redeemed, he's showing us that, that he has provided a way for us to be his image bearers on the earth. Think about that. Like even when we read in the scriptures concerning the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. I don't know all of them by heart. You know, like, you know the fruits. It's me being vulnerable before you. And we know these things, and we see those things. And, and even in that place, I say, Lord, I want, I not only want the signs, wonders, and miracles, because I'm contending for that, 
But at the same time, I want to walk the same way he walked on the earth. And think about how Jesus walked on the earth. Even James, this, I was pondering on this because even when you read James verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. For when the testing of your faith has been approved, I'm like, I'm wanting like you will receive glory. You will receive encounters. You will receive signs, wonders, and miracles. No, you know what you get? Patience. Patience. Really, James? That's, that's it. I, patience. I learned that from Mr. Rogers when I was four. Patience? That's it? Testing for the produces patience, but even I begin to ponder on the patience of Jesus. I begin to ponder on even how Jesus would have, li- how he lived and walked the earth, and he was patient with us, even in our weaknesses. He still is patient. One of my favorite scriptures, when I declare who God is, I declare that he is long suffering, abounding in loving kindness. He, what does the Bible say about God? Who, his nature, his literal nature. He is slow to anger. Think, just meditate on that. Aren't you thankful? We could have a praise break right now that he is slow to anger. He's not flying off the cuff. He's not smacking you down. No, no. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. That's who he is. I want to model that. I want to carry that. I, I want to walk in the Spirit and bear the fruits of the Spirit because I can guarantee you as we begin to walk like Christ did on the earth, the signs, wonders, and miracles will just naturally come. When you walk in that love, that, 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 that sacrificial love towards the hurting and the broken, listen, the miracles are going to follow that. The prophetic words are going to follow that. We've got to make sure that we understand this. Listen, you know, even when you think about that concerning fruit, you know, years ago I was like, man, I I really want to plant some fruit trees at our house. You can just buy them at Lowe's, right? It's pretty crazy. Like, I want an orange tree. I'm going to buy an orange tree. I don't know if you can here. They probably not grow very well. But, you know. And then I was like, you know, man, an apple tree would be great. Apocalypse comes, we'll have apples. <laughs> Live off the land. Country boy can survive, you know? <laughs> you know how long it takes for an apple tree after you plant it to bear fruit? Eight years. That's why I didn't buy an apple tree. <laughs> Gifts are freely given. Fruit has to be cultivated. And y'all, it takes time. It takes attention. It takes John 15, 1, pruning. I love what Jesus says right there when he's like, for those that are bare fruit, you're like, yeah, it's me, I'm bearing fruit. He prunes. Lord, my bearing fruit should exempt me from your scissors. Rather, it attracts them. I prune that they may bear more fruit. You're like, thank you, Lord. (laughs) Why? Because he's wanting us to bear fruit. It takes being planted when everything in you says to uproot. It says be patient when you're frustrated that things aren't happening on your account. Seriously, you can plant that fruit tree and dump fertilizer and miracle grow and protein powder all over it <laughs> to try to make it grow, but guess what? It won't. You can dump water on it every single day. Put lights on it, extra lights. But at the end of the day, there's a process that it has to grow through in order for it to grow. Can I tell you, you're planted, just keep growing. You're being planted, just keep growing. Because here's the deal. You can never see the growth just from the outside. 
You, you never see it happen. You, you, it's not like you see it happening right in front of your eyes. You're growing even if you don't realize it. He has you in a place right now to bear his image by bearing his fruit. All right, number three. Then we're going to close in a second. Get this. I want you to understand this. God is a craftsman. Hear this, okay? God is a craftsman. He's a master builder. This is the comparison between somebody who is a master woodworking craftsman and Ikea. <laughs> now, I love Ikea. We got Ikea furniture. Why? Because, like, when, don't buy real furniture until you move into your forever home. Can I get a witness? Like, like moving Ikea, like, it breaks into a thousand pieces. You're like, yeah, just throw it away. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but. It's heavier when you have something real, amen? Think about this, though. Yes, the, the, the table from Ikea or the table from Ashley is a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. Thousands of dollars cheaper compared to the process that it took in order to build something and to craft something. And I, I feel that for a lot of us today is we need to change the way we think about God and realize he's not a mass producer. His hand is intricately working on you as we speak. He's forming and fashioning you. He's working on you even when you, you, you don't feel like it. And even when you feel like you've been in a season that's been extended for a really long time. And when will I be ready? And when will I be able to step in this place? He's working on you right now in ways that you don't even realize. I, I, I read this. I thought this was so fascinating. It takes six months to make one Rolls Royce. But 13 hours to make a Toyota. Get that. Six months for one Rolls Royce, 13 hours for a Toyota. Now, I love Toyotas. Amen. But you see the difference. You see the, the, the change there. Listen, if you feel like your process is taking longer than you expected, it's because of his love and his dedication to you. I remember years ago, um, you know, I was uh, 22 and Lexi and I were about to get married, and we were dating, and we're, you know, we're, I was about to pop the coach, we celebrate 10 years of marriage this year, so excited. And I'll never forget, even then, we were like, man, what's, what's the dream, like, what's our dream? Like, if we could do anything in the world, what would it be? And I remember our dream was, I remember us saying this, we would be on this leadership team at the ramp. Like, that was our dream. Let's do it. And we're doing that now. We're living our dream. We love it. We're, we're thriving. We're so happy. But there was a time period between 22 and 32 that he had to tell us to move to Brownsville. And we were youth pastors, pegging kids with dodgeballs and eating little Caesars. <laughs> then we moved back and we're here for a season that was amazing. You know, it, it was perfect. And then one day we heard a voice move to Tampa. And we were like, no. <laughs> you know? And it didn't make sense. And it was, it didn't make sense at all. And I remember we wrestled with it for a long, long time. Long story short, we moved down there. We were there for three years. We moved back almost exactly a year ago. And I was thinking about this in relation to the service, how even, even in that place when I was 22 in my dream, I was nowhere ready to step into the promise God had for me. I was not ready. He had to send me through a season of testing, of trial. He had to break selfish ambition off of my life. He had to break pride out of my life. He had to hide me. And listen, a lot of times people say, God, I want you to use me. And you know what the answer to that prayer is? Is he hides you. God, I want a voice to shake nation. He says, okay. And he pulls you into the wilderness. God, I, I want to be used in this arena. And God, I want to write music that changed the world. And what does he do? He pushes you into the shepherd's field with David. I remember when we were about to move, he, move from here, 
I remember the Lord just speaking to me very gently, and He said, Jacob, you know you're not going to preach a lot, preach a lot, right? And that was something in me that I, 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 I took hold of that thing where I was so focused on operating in gifts that I was forgetting my real actual call of just being His son. And He had to grind it out of me. Can I tell you the love of the Lord a lot of times looks like Him grinding those things out of you. In order for the oil to, uh, the olive to produce oil, He's got to crush you. In order for the, the grape to produce wine, it has to be pressed. Listen, I know you're being pressed right now, but He's the one doing it. I know you got questions. God, why am I here? What am I doing? I don't understand. At the end of the day, you have to understand that as he begins to press you, the oil will begin to flow. Last one is this. And then we'll close. We'll pray. Jesus embraced the cross when we run from it. That's another one of those things where we talk about, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. When we actually, we start following Jesus and he's standing there holding the cross and we're like, hold up. You didn't really mean that, right? I love even how Jesus, when he would confront the disciples, do y'all remember when he had a lot of people following him and Jesus turned and looked at them and said, guys, come here, I got, a, I got a new leadership challenge for you. And they're like, yes. If you want to be my disciple... You got to eat my flesh. You got to drink my blood. And I love that Jesus wasn't like, guys, but really, I'm just being symbolic. This is what I mean. He left it like that to where people were like, dude, Jerry, you invited me out here for this? like bro they, hopefully they can track our cell phones because we about to die <laughs> and then they all left and I love Jesus looks at his disciples and is like are y'all leaving too because he could care he literally was like y'all, y'all want to go too and Peter was like I guess not. who else would we go to Lord <laughs> think about that though When Jesus is calling us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, he's calling us to a literally dying of ourselves. A lot of what has even had me on the turn recently is I dug this book back up, Radical Cross by A.W. Tozer. Has anybody read this? It is. If you raise your hand if you've read this, anybody? It is so good. You got to Amazon it tonight. Radical Cross. By A.W. Tozer. Literally, the whole book is highlighted. Let me, let me just pull out one quote that I thought was so good in, in light to this. Listen to this. It says, So we talk a lot about the deeper life and spiritual victory and becoming dead to ourselves. Listen, but we stay very busy rescuing ourselves from the cross. That part of ourselves that we rescue from the cross may be a very little part of us, but is likely to be the seat of our spiritual troubles and our defeats. No one wants to die on a cross until he comes to the place where he is desperate for the highest will of God in serving Jesus Christ. Listen, Listen to what it says. This is another quote from this book. Though the cross of Christ has been beautified by the poet and the artist, the avid seeker after God is likely to find it the same savage implement of destruction it was in the days of old. The way of the cross is still the pain-wrecked path to spiritual power and fruitfulness. Listen, so do not seek to hide from it. Do not accept an easy way. Do not allow yourself to be padded to sleep in a comfortable church, void of power and barren of fruit. Do not paint the cross nor deck it with flowers. Take it for what it is, as it is, and you will find it the rugged way to death and life. Let it slay you utterly. Worship Tim, you can go ahead and come on up. Let it slay you utterly. And, And so many times, even here recently, I've... Even fasting, I found myself in that place of saying, 
Maybe I'm not so good as denying my flesh as I thought I was. Maybe the voice of the flesh is a little bit louder in my life than I thought it was. Maybe I'm being led by my flesh more than I'm being led by my spirit. But we all come to a place where we either have to say, I'm going to embrace the cross or I'm going to try to save myself from it. I'm either going to do this. I'm either going to die myself. I'm going to take up my cross. Even as Paul said, I'm, the, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What, what, what am I going to do? You're in a place right now where you, just like Jesus, he had the cross before him. And I love reading the story when Jesus was in the garden. It's, it's such a beautiful picture of Jesus. It's, even as we're, you know, I love even meditating on it and getting closer to the Easter season. When we see Jesus in the garden, just think about that, guys. Jesus, the son of the living God, he's, he's running, he's, he's literally drenched in sweat and blood and tears and hurting and broken. And, and he leaves his disciples and goes stone thrown away and he's crying out to God. And what did Jesus even say? Guys, Jesus prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, if it is, your, if it is possible, let the cup pass from me. Get that? Even Jesus was in that place where he was facing the cross. He knew what was set before him. And he was in the garden weeping before his father saying, Lord, I, if it's possible, let it be taken from me. But this was a significant moment in the garden, a significant moment in human history. Because even in that place where Jesus was crying out to God in a garden. And he was crying out to God. And he was facing death for the salvation of the world. In that moment, another prayer uttered out of his lips, uttered out of his mouth that shifted everything. What he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And we've got to see that that's such a powerful moment because what that's actually pointing back to is here, Jesus was in the garden saying, not my will, but yours be done. And he's pointing back to in the beginning when another man named Adam was in a garden and he was saying, not your will, but mine be done. He was redeeming us for just like Adam had, had everything before him, but rather he chose his own way above God's way. Jesus came and paved a way for us to look boldly at the Father and say, Lord, I know it's not going to be easy. I know it's not going to be fun. But Lord, you are the joy set before me. And not my will, but yours be done. Lord, I, I know I don't understand it. And I, I, I know... I'm in this place where things aren't happening the way I thought they should. And Lord, that this person abandoned me and I feel so hurt and I feel so broken and the door hasn't opened and all I have is questions, but it doesn't feel like I have any answers. But at the end of the day, Lord, my answer is not my will, but yours be done. I'm telling you, if that's the prayer of your heart, you can do anything. If that's the prayer on the inside of your heart, you're going to be okay. God, not my will, but yours be done. Let's stand on.